Good afternoon, everyone, and you're very welcome to today's webinar. Auto enrollment is about to change. Are you ready? So we've already completed a sound check a few minutes ago. And um, so with people who have already logged on. So let's get started. Um, today's webinar is CPD accredited and you can benefit from 1.5 CPD points. If you would like a CPD certificate, please fill in the survey at the end of today's webinar and we will send out the CPD certs within the next few days. Today we will also have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar and we will try to get through as many questions as possible. If you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the questions bar at the right of your screen on your control panel. Today's webinar is also being recorded and we will send out the recording and along with a copy of the slides to all attendees later today or early tomorrow. So first up today we have Paul Byrne and Paul is the Managing Director here at BrightPay. He is also a Chartered Accountant having previously spent over 20 years running his own practice. Today, Paul is going to discuss upcoming changes to auto enrollment, particularly in relation to both the increases in minimum contribution rates and how auto enrollment will affect new employers. Today, we are also delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Adam Connor, who is the Employer Relationship Manager at Aviva. Adam has been working in the financial services industry for the last 30 years. Having spent the last 17 years working for Aviva, Adam is now responsible for working with employers and business advisors, supporting them with auto enrollment. Today, Adam is going to discuss what you need to know about choosing a workplace pension scheme. I'm now going to pass you over to Paul to begin the first part of today's webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Let's get myself set up here. Okay, so before I get started, uh, let's just have a quick look at the agenda for today's webinar. First up, we will have a look at the forthcoming contribution increases and how to support your clients and their employees regarding the increases. We will also have a look at ongoing auto enrollment duties, including re-enrollment, and how auto enrollment will affect new employer clients. Finally, we will give you a demonstration of just or, or, of how BrightPay will handle these changes. And just before we pass you over to Aviva for part two, we will also give you a look at our optional add-on product, BrightPay Connect, uh, which will help with the upcoming GDPR requirements. So starting off first with the forthcoming contribution increases. By law, the minimum contribution rates for auto enrollment are set to increase uh, over the next 14 months. There are two stages to the, to the increase in minimum contributions, which has been described as phasing. The first increase will take place this coming April, and the second increase is in April 2019. On the 6th of April 2018, the total minimum, minimum contribution will increase from 2% to 5%. Employers will need to contribute a, ma sorry, a minimum of 2%, with employees contributing the remaining 3%. Minimum, minimum contributions will undergo further increases on the 6th of April 2019, with the total minimum contribution rate increasing to 8%, representing a 3% employer and 5% employee contribution. It is, it, it is an employer's responsibility to make sure that they, have, they are prepared for these new contribution levels. The employer and the employee can choose to contribute a higher amount to the pension scheme if they wish. If an employer chooses to pay more than the employer minimum, but less than the total minimum amount, then the employee must make up the difference. If an employer wishes, they can decide to pay the total minimum contribution rate, which is 5% from, from April 2018 and 8% from April 2019. In these cases, the employee does not have to pay any contributions unless the rules of the pension scheme say otherwise. In certain cases where the employee and employer are contributing above the current minimum requirements of the workplace pension scheme, an increase in contributions will not be required if the total contribution is above the new minimum contribution. If an employer is making pen pension contributions as part of a salary sacrifice agreement, it is important to note that their employees' contracts of employment may need to be reviewed and amended as a result of phasing. 
For example, consider an employee whose current contract of employment states that they will sacrifice 1% of their salary in return for the for the employer paying the equivalent amount of the pension scheme along with their own 1% employer contribution, how will the new April 2018 minimum, minimum requirement now be met? Phasing will apply to all employers who have staff enrolled into a workplace pension scheme. For employers who don't have staff enrolled, then they do not need to take any further action. It is important for payroll process to, to know when and how much to deduct when both sets of increases come into effect. Typically, any good payroll software will automatically prompt you when the increases happen in real time. The pensions regulator is advising employers and payroll bureaus to check with their current payroll software provider to ensure it will handle and calculate the increased contribution amounts. It is important to note that increased contributions are required to be processed on the first pay date after the 6th of April. Therefore, you should take steps to ensure that the increases have been put in place correctly, particularly for the first payroll run. Employers or payroll bureaus on their behalf need to speak to the chosen pension provider to find out if any steps need to be taken to allow for the new increased rates. Some pension providers have already begun to communicate with employers in preparation for the increases. So the question remains, how can you support your clients and their employees with regard to increased minimum contribution rates? The pensions regulator is sending letters to all employers informing them about the increases happening in April. Some pension providers have already begun to communicate the increases to their customers and their members. It would be a good idea to touch base with your current workplace pension provider to find out what kind of support they are offering to inform staff about the increases, as not all pension providers are doing so. Unlike the initial assessment and enrolment of the staging date or duty start date, it is not a mandatory requirement to inform or write to staff about the increases in minimum contributions. However, it would be considered best practice to clearly communicate with employees to let them know before the increase takes place. This will help minimize confusion and reduce queries. The pensions regulator has a sample letter, uh, letter template available to employers and bureaus to give to the employees, which should help employees understand the upcoming changes. This letter is available to download in the handout section on your control panel, and we will also include it in the follow-up email to everyone. So this is part of uh, the CPD requirement and getting it, it certified for CPD. We need to ask you one question. Um, and it's an A, B or C answer. So the question is, are employers required to give employees a letter regarding increases in minimum contribution rates? So here you just need to click on your answer on the screen. So is it A, yes, the employer is required to do this for all employees. B, yes, but only if the employee's contribution rates have changed. C, no, there is no legal requirement to do this, but it is advised. It is advised. Okay, so we just wait for some of the answers to come in there. Okay, 87% of you got that right. So I presume the other 13% weren't listening. Okay. Um, now, ongoing autumn enrollment duties. <clears throat> All employers must assess their employees on an ongoing basis to see if any of their staff become eligible for autumn and automatic enrollment. Where an employee does become eligible, then the employer must process the minimum contributions that are applicable at that current time period. Similarly, where an employer takes on a new member of staff, the employee must be assessed to determine if enrollment is required. And if so, this new employee is also liable to the minimum contribution rates at that time. Employers are required to continue sending contribution files to the pension provider each pay period. Some pension providers, such as Aviva, have made real headway when it comes to simplifying this step of the process for their users. These pension providers have developed APIs that allow payroll software to fully integrate with them. Direct API integration allows payroll software and the pension scheme to communicate or talk directly to each other, which is a similar concept to RTI. API integration means that users no longer need to export and save the data file to their PC and then log into the pension provider web portal to upload the pension data. 
Instead, data can be sent directly to the pension provider at the click of a button from within the payroll software. This method of sending information between two systems would be of particular interest to bureaus who could have a large number of payroll clients. The integration will enable bureaus to reduce errors and minimize the time spent submitting their clients' files to the pension provider. At the moment, BrightPay has API integration with Nest, Aviva, and Smart Pension. And I'm delighted to say that BrightPay is the very first payroll provider to offer API integration with Aviva to our customers. BrightPay has further APIs with Nest to validate group, groups and payment sources and to approve contribution payments from within the software. This integration uh, further streamlines the setup and ongoing tasks involved when using Nest as your pension provider. We will offer further API integration with other pension providers this year. Currently, we are working with two other pension providers, including the People's Pension. We hope to have this API integration available over the coming months. API integration with pension providers is, de is developed by the pension provider themselves and then made available to the payroll software providers. So if API functionality is not in the software, it's probably because the pension provider has not yet developed it. Continuing on on the ongoing duties, these will vary depending on whether you have staff to re-enroll. Um, and this, this is in relation to re-enrollment. So the first step in, in re-enrollment is to choose your re-enrollment date, and this should be done as soon as possible. Your re-enrollment date is chosen by you within a six-month window to choose from. Therefore, you may decide to align your re-enrollment date with other business processes, such as the start of your financial year or to, or avoid, to avoid seasonal peaks. This re-enrollment window falls three months either side of the third anniversary of your staging date. Regardless of whether or not you use postponement at your staging date, re-enrollment occurs three years after your staging date, not your deferral date. The chosen re-enrollment date will apply to all staff. You can't use different dates for different staff members or groups of staff. Also be aware that postponement cannot be used for re-enrollment. Once you reach your re-enrollment date, you will need to assess certain staff to work out if you need to put them back into your pension scheme. You only need to assess staff who have previously opted out or voluntarily ceased active membership of a qualifying scheme. You must determine whether these employees meet the criteria to be automatically re-enrolled. So you, who must you re-enroll? You must re-enroll anyone who has left your autumn enrollment pension scheme more than 12 months before your re-enrollment date. Anyone who's aged 22 and state pension age, or sorry, between 22 and state pension age, and who earns over earn the earnings threshold, which is currently £10,000 per annum. Again, it should be said that the software, payroll software, should alert you to when re-enrollment needs to take place and also on, your, on what duties and who needs to be enrolled when that happens. In terms of re-enrolling staff members, you also have the option to re-enroll uh, directors uh, those who are partners in a limited liability partnership, those who have left the scheme within 12 months of your re-enrollment date, and those who have given notice or have been given notice of the, of the end of their employment. Having worked out which staff must be re-enrolled, you must now put them back into a pension scheme within six weeks of your re-enrollment date. It is your legal duty to write to each member's staff you have re-enrolled into your pension scheme. This also must be completed within six weeks after your re-enrollment date. You do not have to write to staff that are not being put back into your pension scheme. And carrying on from, from re-enrollment, all employers must complete the redeclaration of co compliance, even if you do not have staff to re-enroll into your pension scheme. And this informs the pensions regulator that you have completed your automatic re-enrollment duties. So make sure that your chosen payroll software can handle the re-enrollment process and ensure there is no additional charge for automatic, automatic enrollment or re-enrollment functionality. Okay, so new employers and auto enrollment. We have now reached the end of the actual the rollout of auto enrollment, whereby all employers had a staging date to kickstart their employer responsibilities. Going forward, 
all new employers will be affected by autumn enrollment with immediate effect, apart from that is single director companies. So if a client becomes a new employer or, be, or became a new employer after the 1st of October, 2017, they do not have a staging date. Instead, they have a duty start date, which kickstarts their autumn enrollment duties. Your client should be ready to comply with the legal automatic enrollment duties as soon as the first employee begins employment. Again, I suppose I should say that's the first employee after the single director that may have already been on the payroll. Where your client is a new employer and about to employ some, someone for the first time, they will need to complete certain tasks in preparation for auto enrollment. Once they have registered as an employer with HMRC, you or your client will need to inform the pensions regulator of the chosen point of contact for auto enrollment. Just like when an employer reaches their staging date, the new employer will be required to choose a pension scheme that will be suitable to their business and employees. On the first pay date after the duty start date, similar to staging, all employees must be assessed to determine whether or not they need to be automatically enrolled into a pension scheme. Any eligible employees must be automatically enrolled into a qualifying auto enrollment pension scheme where the employer must also make contributions to the pension pot. Increases in minimum contribution rates also apply to new employers, whereby if an employer reaches their auto enrollment duties start date on or after the 6th of April 2018, they will immediately be required to comply and implement the total minimum 5% contribution rate. Equally, employers who reach their duty start date on or after the 6th of April 2019 will need to comply with the, with the total minimum 8% contribution rate. Postponement can still be used to defer the commencement of AE deductions and contributions, and this can be up for up, for up to three months. Communication repostponement must still be made within uh, six weeks of the uh, duty start date. Okay, so up to now, the 1% and 1% levels may have been hardly noticed by the employee. There may have been a real feel-good aspect for them in actually doing something about retirement planning and yet it costing so little. This will change materially in the coming years. Some employees may cease active membership because they, may, they might feel it's just too expensive. Those that remain will take it a lot more seriously. This is now real money going in. For example, from the 6th of April 2019, an employee earning, say, £600 per week will see over £2,000 going into their pension scheme annually. For an employee on, say, £1,000 per week, it will be 3200 annually. And that's under the, uh, what's they call it, the qualify or the, what's the, the, name? Standard, the standard qualifying earnings uh, arrangements. So they will naturally take a lot more interest in, in where this money is being invested and who it is being handled by. They will be paying close attention to their online pension portals. So really, my, my point here is that pension scheme selection is no longer a box ticking exercise. I did some calculations on, on the example employees from the previous slide, for, that is an employee earning £600 per week and an employee earning £1,000 per week. And this is in relation to salary sacrifice, which I think is something that's going to become a lot more prevalent uh, over the next couple of years because of the increase in the amount of uh, contributions. In the exercise, I looked at, uh, say, the first employee earning £600 per week. If using salary sacrifice, um, that employee will see an increase in weekly take-home pay of just under £3 per week, which is roughly £150 in a year. The employer also sees a reduction of £3.34 uh, per week, which is £174 in a year in their total staff costs. So the overall savings uh, is just over £320 per annum. It's not inconsequential. The employee earning £1,000 per week, um, we did a similar exercise there, they will see an increase in weekly take-home pay of £8.22 per week, uh, which is £427 in a year. The employer also sees a reduction of £5.35 per week, which is £278 in a year. Um, overall tax and NI savings in that case came to over £700 in the year. 
So as I say, it is something that will become a, a bit more prevalent uh, in, in the coming years. Okay, so we're now going to have a look at how BrightPay will support new employers with regards to their new automatic enrollment duties, as well as how BrightPay will handle the increase in minimum contributions. So I'm going to, ha I'm going to now pass you over to Victoria Clark from the support team to take you through this short demonstration. Thank you, Vicky. Many thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Just bear with me there just when I bring up the company here. Okay, so the sample company I have um, this afternoon is a new employer. And just to speed things up, um, I already have my employees entered. And all my employees have a start date ended of the 1st of March. So you can see here that I'm in the current month 12 um, and they're all monthly paid there. So as soon as BrightPay detects that the company is a new employer, um, it will give you a series of flags here. And if I just click into my first employee, um, you'll see that BrightPay is prompting me that I may have automatic enrollment duties. So it's asking me now to confirm my status as an employer and to go ahead and enter my duties start date. So I'm going to use the shortcut here to enter duties start date. This brings me through to the pensions utility in the software. And you'll see here that we have a few little workflows. Um, so you're obviously just choosing the option that's um, applicable to the company. So for myself here with my employees starting on the 1st of March, um, I'm going to be selecting this option here. My first staff member started or will start on or after the 1st of October 2017. Okay, so the software is now telling me that my due to start date is when my first member of staff is starting. So I'm going to click on save changes. And this then gives me a little box where I can fill in the start date of my first member of staff. So I'm going to put in the 1st of March there and save changes. Okay. The next step for me is to then enter details of the pension provider that I have um, gone with. And to do that, I'm going to click on add new scheme at the top of the pensions utility. So you'll see here now on screen that BrightPay um, is currently compatible with 18 different pension providers. They're listed there for you. And where we um, are compatible, that basically means that we can do the full pension process for you. We can So basically we can produce the pension files in the right format for upload into these various pension providers. Um, so I'll use Aviva as our example this afternoon. So I'm going to just click on Aviva here. I just need to enter my scheme reference. This you'll be able to get from Aviva um, when you were setting up the scheme with them. And Aviva is an example of a pension provider, as Paul has mentioned, um, that has API integration. So it works like RTI, where this will send your pension files directly from the software into the portal, into the Aviva portal. So I'm just going to select Aviva API here. Um, I then just need to set up the details of the scheme. So I'm going to click into category one here. I'm just going to my category ID again, just some dummy information I'm popping in here. Um, so on this screen, I need to tell the software what my contribution um, rates are. So you'll see the various options here. We default to use phased minimum contribution rates, but of course that can be changed by the user if another option is applicable. Um, so I'm just going to use the phase minimum rates here just to simplify things. Also as well, you just need to tell the software um, what the earnings basis is in, to be in operation. So again, by default, we default to standard qualifying earnings. Um, and you can see here the current 17, 18 um, lower limit and upper limit there. However, if need be, um, if you're operating the pension scheme without these or you need to customize these, you can pop into custom qualifying earnings and change as necessary. Um, so again, just for simplicity here, I'll just use a standard qualifying earnings. When that's set up, I'm going to click save and my pension scheme information is now saved in the software. If I now return to the payroll screen, you'll now see that my yellow alert has changed. And what BrightPay is now doing is automatically assessing my um, members of staff for me. So in the background, it's working away. Um, so you can see my first employee is being assessed as an eligible job holder. And if I click on a few options, I'm presented with three options for this worker category. So I can go ahead and enroll the employee. Um, I could postpone 
or mark as exempt if that were applicable. So I'm going to enroll my first employee. So I'm going to click the enroll button here. Click on scheme and I'm going to choose Aviva from my listing here. And then you just need to choose the applicable tax relief. So with Aviva, we have either non or relief at source. So I'll just leave it as relief at source. To enroll just the one employee, I would just press the button continue there. However, if I have um, a number of employees who kind of match the, the information above there, so if I want to enroll more than one employee at the same time, I simply click the option enroll multiple employees with these settings. I can select them all. And those five employees are now all enrolled at the same time. So it really quickens things up for you there. As soon as employees are enrolled in BrightPay, then BrightPay will then automatically prepare the enrollment letter, which you are obliged to give to enrolled employees. And to generate that, you're simply going to click on the letter option here. And you can either print them physically, um, you can export a PDF, or you can email them directly from the software to the employee if you have the employee's email addresses in their employee records. I just print one to screen there so you can see the content. Um, so these are the, based on this, the pensions regulator's standardized letter template. So the information you're seeing here can't be changed. Um, however, everything is covered here as required, okay? So once your employees are in receipt of this enrollment letter, you can then instruct the software that this has been done to stop you getting reminders that they're outstanding. Again, just for one employee, you can just mark as done for this employee, or you can do a batch processing of this. Okay, and when I return to the payroll screen, you'll see the flags have disappeared now for those five employees. So I've dealt with their duties at this point. My next employee, he's been assessed as a non-eligible job holder. And if I click on view options, there's four options for this worker category. So you are obliged to write to the employee telling them that they do have a right to opt into the pension scheme should they choose to do so. And this letter is here for you. And again, the same options that we give you for the enrollment letters. So you can print, export to PDF or email. And once done, you can mark as done there as well. Okay. Um, my next employee is being assessed as an entitled worker. And again, if I click on view options, I'm given similar options as to non-eligible job holders here. Um, so to, again, you're obliged to write to the employee telling them that they have the right to join. Should they then choose to join the scheme, you have the join button here. And again, you can postpone or mark as exempt. And um, that's across the board with the three worker categories. Um, so if I were to postpone, I simply click the postpone option here and I enter my deferral date in the software. So it has to be th within a, with maximum three months. OK, and the software will prompt you if you try and enter a date that's more than three months in the future. OK, and again, I can press continue just to postpone the one employee or I can postpone multiple employees at the same time, which I'll do here. OK. Again, BrightPay will then produce the necessary postponement letter, which then must be given to these employees. Here, again, the same options again to print, export, or email. And then when the employees are in receipt of this, tell the software that this is done. Okay. So when I return to my payroll screen now, all the flags have disappeared. So I've dealt with every single employee here in my first pay period. If I just choose an employee that I enrolled, you'll now see that their pension contributions are now appearing um, on their payslip view here. And if I finalize the payslips and go to print or email those payslips now, the, um, the, the employee's physical payslips will also reference that contribution that's being made both by the employee and employer. You'll now see that the number two has appeared next to my pensions heading, and that's now to inform me that I have two pension files that are outstanding and that I need to submit those to Aviva. Um, so if I click into the pensions utility here, so Aviva are an example of a pension provider that require two files to be submitted to them. So the first one being the enrollment file, and then 
every pay period onwards, they, um, sorry, every tax month onwards that they require a contributions file as well. So I'm just going to click into enrollment summary here. And you'll see now that you're being prompted to send your enrollment submission. So this is the Aviva API submission that I'm going to show you now. So I'm going to click on send enrollment submission at the top right. I select my employees. At the next step, um, you just need to um, indicate whether the contributions are being made under a salary exchange um, contract. Um, so I just click on next there. And at step three, all you're doing is clicking on send now. When you click on send now, that will bring up um, a window where you enter your Aviva login details, and that then will send the information off to Aviva. I'm in a test environment here, obviously, so I can't do that here for you. But what will then happen if that is successfully received, this yellow box at the top will be updated to let you know that that um, submission has been successfully received. OK. The contributions submission then. So with Aviva, it's a tax monthly submission. Um, so I've just updated my month 12. So I'm going to click on send submission now. And I just choose the tax month for which I'm submitting for. So it will be tax month 12. Click on next. Again, select the employees. Again, just indicate whether you're making the contribution via a salary exchange. And for any employee where there's been just a partial or non-payment of the contribution, you just need to indicate why. OK. And a step four, again, you're clicking on send now. And that will then send off the contributions data to Aviva again. OK. And again, once that file's accepted, you'll get confirmation here at the top right that that um, has been successfully received. Okay. Ongoing then, um, BrightPay, as Paul has mentioned, um, will continually assess your employees for you. I'm at the final pay period of 1718, but if you were to import this into 1819 BrightPay, um, the continual assessment will take place for you there. Okay, so the software is continually monitoring. So any employee turning 22, for example, or any new employees that join at a later date, you'll see those flags appear to tell you that you have duties to perform. Paul mentioned their re-enrollment. And if I just pop back into the pensions utility and into the automatic enrollment section here, um, when you enter your due to start date, BrightPay will automatically place the re-enrollment date in for you as well. So it always does exactly three years um, after your due to start date. As Paul talked about there, you do have a three month window either side of that date. So by all means, the user can pop in here at any point and amend that should they choose to do so. And um, obviously this is a new employer company. Um, so re-enrollment would be a long way off yet. But basically what will happen at re-enrollment date um, is that in the pay period in which that re-enrollment date falls, BrightPay will kick in with very, very similar flags that you've just seen appear in the software now. So if it detects that there's anybody to be enrolled and assessed again, um, you'll get the on-screen flags and yellow alerts to, to inform you of that. Okay, um, I'm just going to pop back to the presentation here because I now just want to show you how BrightPay is going to handle phasing from the 6th of April. Okay, so I've just a few screens here to show you. Um, so what I have on screen here is the is an example of month 12 of the current tax year, so the 17-18 tax year. I'm just going to show you three employees. So my first employee, Benedict Taylor, at month 12, he has the current phased um, minimum contributions of 1% and 1% in place. Okay, so here's an example of an employee with the, with the current minimum. Casper here is um, an example of an employee who's got, currently got above the minimum. So the employee contribution in 1718 is 2% and the employer contribution is 2% as well. And my third employee, Haley. She, in month 12 of the current tax year, has 5% employee contribution and 5% employer contribution. Okay, so 
when um, BrightPay 1819 is released, you will find um, an import button where you can bring across your 1718 BrightPay employer um, data. So if I now click into month one here of our 1819 software, so on that import, it will bring everything across. It brings everything across as it stands at that final pay period of 1718. So if I now select Benedict Taylor, he was an employee that had 1% and 1% in operation. So what BrightPay will do in the very first period of the new tax year is that it will detect that um, this employee had the minimum rates in place and it will automatically uplift these rates to the new phased minimum rates of 3% and 2% for you. So you have nothing to do there and BrightPay will take care of that for you. Casper. He was an employee that had 2% and 2% in operation. BrightPay has brought that through and you can see those rates are still here. But now this employee, even though he was above the minimum in um, the 17, 18 tax year, he's now below the new minimum. So you're now getting the yellow alert to say that something needs to be done. This needs to be fixed. BrightPay doesn't want to make an assumption and just increase the employee contribution automatically. Um, so it's going to get the user to choose what needs to be done. So the user just then needs to click on fix and you'll be given um, a few options here. So whether you want to apply the minimum employee or employer rates or just to increase the employer contribution rate only. So if I choose the first one, that then clears your yellow alert and it's increased the employee contribution to 3% and the employee contribution is to still 2% so you're meeting the new requirements. Hayley was my third employee. She was 5% and 5% and in this instance, BrightPay has done nothing because she was above the minimum last tax year and she's now above the minimum new requirements as well. So her record has stayed exactly the same there. I just want to show you as well, um, because um, some of you may actually be operating the pension contributions, you may have fixed amounts entered rather than percentage rates. So what BrightPay will do if fixed amounts have been in operation on import, what the software will do is it will convert the fixed rates that you do have entered, the fixed amounts, and in the background, it will do a percentage calculation for you. And it, in the background, it's detecting whether you're meeting the, the new 3% and 2% requirement of the, the 5% overall. So you can see here that my £40 and £30 contribution isn't matching that you know it isn't at the required minimum level. So again, I've got my yellow alert. I need to click on fix and actually correct that. So um, it's then changed my amounts accordingly for me. And of course the user can also go in and change that as they wish. Okay. If I finalize the pay period then, okay, and go into month two, then those new settings are retained in the software, um, so they'll be carried forward each pay period for you there. Okay, so that completes the demonstration. I'm just going to pass you back to Rachel now. Thanks, Vicky, that was very useful. Uh, so you can see from our demo there that um, implementing the increases uh, will be very seamless in BrightPay. So uh, now just, I'm going to take a few minutes just to give you a quick peek at our optional add-on BrightPay Connect. So BrightPay Connect is an optional add-on that works alongside BrightPay on your desktop. Payroll information is stored in the cloud and can be accessed online, but the payroll itself must be processed on BrightPay on your desktop. The online functionality allows access anywhere, anytime, for payroll bureaus and accountants, their clients, and their clients' employees. So secure online backup. BrightPay Connect automatically synchronizes and backs up payroll data to the cloud, protecting against ransomware and cyber attacks. It will automatically back up a payroll file every 15 minutes when it's open, and again when the payroll file is closed down. So if I click on Restore Backup here, um, you'll see it keeps a chronological history of backups, um, which can be restored at any time. 
Accountants can give online access to clients' payroll information via the employer dashboard. Clients can log in any time online to see up-to-date payroll information. The online employer portal will give clients access to employees and their pay slips, payroll reports, a company-wide annual leave calendar, amounts due to HMRC, and employee documents. Employees can also log into their own password protected self service portal. Here, employees can view current and historic payslips and other payroll documents such as P60s. Payslips are automatically added to the employee self service portal each pay period, and this eliminates the need to print or email place. Employees will automatically receive an email letting them know that the newest payslip is available. The password protected employee online portal will enable employees to easily submit holiday requests and view leave taken and leave remaining. Going back to the employer dashboard, Brightpick Connect gives clients an interactive HR and annual leave management facility. Employers can view all upcoming leave in the Brightpay Connect company-wide calendar. Employers can also authorise leave requests with changes automatically flowing back to the payroll software. And finally then, employers can also upload HR documents including employee contracts and staff handbooks. So um, in this example, we used the document upload feature to upload the pensions regulators letter to employees informing them about upcoming in contribution increases. So um, I hope that gave you an idea of how Brightpay Connect can benefit your payroll bureau. Today, we just gave a very quick introduction to Brightpay Payroll and Brightpay Connect, but we do run online demos of both systems nearly every day. The demos are free to attend and last approximately 20 minutes. Just before I pass you over to Adam for part two, um, I would just like to say Brightpay's bureau license includes unlimited employers, unlimited employees, and auto enrollment functionality. It also includes free phone and email support, and this costs just £229 plus VAT per tax year. And um, so that's it for our part of the presentation. So bear with us for two minutes just while we get Adam set up. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Connor, and I work for Aviva's SME Business Channel and have worked for Aviva for the last 17 years. I've been involved with auto enrollment from the start and have helped both organizations, both large and small, to get ready for their employer duties, working with employers directly and also through business advisors. Now, the central theme of today's presentation is to share the experiences we've gained at Aviva to get with broader insight we've gathered over time from professionals working with auto enrollment every day. We will then consider the question, What's next for auto-enrollment? Now it's time to say hands up and be really honest and admit that we don't pretend for one minute that the answer to this question is a viva every time. It's true that one size does not fit all. There are numerous factors to consider and the relevance and importance of each will differ from client to client. Now my presentation should last around 25 minutes, but there will be time to take questions at the end. So here are the general themes um, that we will be looking to uh, cover today. The first one will be re-enrollment and the phasing of contributions, new startups, choosing a workplace pension provider. And one of the most common questions I get asked is how does the process work with Aviva? So we'll take a brief look at the end-to-end -end process. And then you have to forgive me for the, the Aviva flag waving at the end, but I promise to keep it short and relevant. So what's next for auto-enrollment? Well, the phasing of contributions and re-enrollments are a real red hot topic at the moment. 
clients will come back time and time again to their business advisor due to the phasing of contributions in 2018 and 2019. The lion's share of auto enrollment has been commenced on minimum contributions, so the demand for services will continue. And then there is the re-enrollment process that has to be performed every three years, another payroll centric function. So what are some of the topics we are discussing every day with customers and business advisors like yourself? Well, since the latter part of 2017, we are starting to see a growing number of clients reviewing whether to change the workplace pension after their re-enrollment date has passed. Now, this has mainly been due to the administration experiences with that provider, but also how it actually works with the payroll processes. The re-enrollment date is an opportunity to review payroll processes, which for many employers found did not work well first time around. Indeed, they may have selected middleware at a cost, but now have the option to integrate payroll processes with payroll at a much smaller cost or none at all, and yet save time and provide a more secure way of managing their pension scheme processes with payroll. Our recent experiences do not assume that a client knows or remembers that phasing is due to commence in April. And equally, we don't assume they've got their costings right either. They need to make sure they have the correct overall contribution rate right for the certification basis they are on. It's no good moving to 5% if you're certified your scheme on basic salaries. This is also an opportunity to see if savings could be achieved through a salary sacrifice arrangement. Having reviewed the impact of auto enrollment for three years and the increased cost going forward for the next two years, salary sacrifice could save the employer on national insurance costs with a chance to reinvest those savings in a number of ways. Clients should think about how to communicate all this to their workforce so there are no nasty surprises. It's also another chance to highlight the value of the employer contributions and mitigate the risk of people opting out or leaving the scheme without being fully informed. In summary, both the three year re, year re enrollment window and the phasing of contributions in April this year and next provides many reasons to engage with clients to help them prepare for what's ahead, view what their process are and communicate to staff. So what's next for auto enrollment? Now there's the new startup businesses from October 2017 that have an immediate auto enrollment duty where they have one employee or more. It's estimated there will be 380,000 new startup firms per annum in the UK in 2018. And around 130,000 of these will employ at least one person. Aviva is fully committed to support new startups with a workplace pension scheme, even if they just have one employee. So what you can do. So this slide has been sourced in part from the pension regulator's own roadshow aimed at accountants. So you can help your clients find information about pension schemes. You can act as a channel for information. Advice to an employer in their capacity as an employer is not a regulated activity. Now, this was a deliberate move by the regulator due to the lack of capacity in the market to make such advice regulated. However, due diligence and documented rationale for provider selection is still key. You need to consider the ethical standards set by your professional body in all this. Delegated duties, roles and responsibilities should be documented in a contract of service or engagement letter. This can help avoid misunderstandings or assumptions. Um, a good example of this is the, um, the declaration of compliance. Ultimately, it's the employer's responsibility to select a workplace pension scheme, whether they're doing so for the first time or reviewing what they have in place already. Not all workplace pension providers are the same. And here are some of the key considerations an employer should take into account when choosing a workplace pension provider. Firstly, charges. There's charges for the employer to set the scheme 
and run it on an ongoing basis, they come in all shapes and sizes. Some have an upfront setup fee, some a monthly employer fee, some nothing at all. Like any purchase, it is hard to compare a free service with a chargeable one and assume it's the same. It rarely is. The question is what value is being provided and how important is that to the company and its employees? How does the provider apply investment and admin charges to the employee's pension pots? Is it a simple annual fund charge or annual fund charge and annual management charge? Or is it a combination of a lower annual fund charge and a monthly fee? The impact a dual fee has for someone with short service can be costly to the pension pot. This impacts employers that have a lot of employees that leave within the first few years. Another consideration is, does the provider have hidden charges for extra ad hoc requests from scheme members? Brand and reputation. How comfortable will the employer be taking money out of staff wages for pensions with a provider that has a little track record or has a recognised name? Would they prefer going with a long-standing traditional provider that has a proven track record not only on providing value for money returns but also riding through financial crashes and market downturns over a long period? Some will want the brand name they know, some, it's true to say, won't care. The FSCS protects 100% of a scheme member's pension pot if they're invested in an insured scheme, i.e. a group personal pension. This protection from the FSCS does not extend to master trusts or occupational schemes. So if it's an assured scheme, does the provider sign up to a master trust assured framework to provide security to? Will the scheme operate tax relief on a net pay basis or a relief at source, which is best for the client. For example, an employee of a low paid workforce or on limited hours, they would always get tax relief with the relief at source system, but may miss out on the net pay system, meaning they would lose a large portion of their entitled pension contribution. The counter argument is a firm with mainly higher rate taxpayers would get their 40% relief through payroll immediately with the net pay system. Whereas with relief at source, they need to make a claim to get that additional relief above the base rate through their tax code self-assessment. Net pay processes tend to apply to occupational schemes and master trusts, whereas GPP or group personal pension or assured schemes apply relief at source. Now there are some occupational style schemes offer both as a choice. Now, choice is great, but only if you know which basis to select for which scheme and why. How each provider works with their employer's payroll software and processes should be front and centre in understanding what the ongoing time and costs of operating the pension scheme will be, not just what the costs that set up are. Is the payroll integrated with the pension provider? How many clicks or processes are there? If the provider is not integrated fully with payroll, then what are their plans to do so? The wrong provider for the payroll software can add significant time and cost to the operation of the scheme. And what about online services, tools and added extras? Online services can vary in the tools, calculators and added extras available for being a scheme member. If I was asked what is Aviva's one unique selling point above its competitors, it would be My Aviva. I will come back to My Aviva later on in the presentation. Another consideration is how easy is a provider to deal with? Some providers are easier to deal with than others, and this is where the test of a free workplace pension can be found wanting against the chargeable one. For example, how easy is it to contact the provider when you need to? The nature of pensions and administration means for one reason or another, those who administer pension schemes for employers often need to speak to the provider, especially around payroll deadlines. Does the client want access to UK call centres where you dial straight through to experts that are immediately on hand? 
Or is it more painful than that from the experience of those who have gone to the low cost option? We accept that some employers will just want the cheapest option possible, regardless of the ongoing servicing considerations. Many don't understand why this is important until they've experienced it. Another key question is, does the provider operate salary sacrifice? How easy is it to run in practice? Can they easily mix and match salary sacrifice with other tax basis, especially when an employee opts out of salary sacrifice but stays in the pension scheme? Where is the money invested? How is the default fund invested? For example, at Aviva, the money goes into a broad mix of assets with the aim of reducing volatility whilst providing value for money ahead of inflation. However, like some other providers, we have a wealth of investment choices that scheme members can select from, including Sharia and ethical investment funds. Some providers offer only a handful of choice, some like Aviva offer hundreds of choices for those who are actively engaged with their investments. Multiple pension pots. If someone has multiple pension pots, how does a provider help an employee merge these into one place? And how do they do this while still protecting the employee from moving pots they shouldn't, like older pots with annuity guarantees at higher interest rates? At Aviva, we have help desks that can provide this service. Are all categories of employees accepted? Does the provider accept anyone? Who do they restrict? What about non-UK residents? What about employers that do not have a UK bank account? In principle, Aviva will accept any scheme from one employee upwards. However, we cannot enroll non-UK residents and the employer must pay contributions from a UK bank account. Different providers have different stances on this and everything we have discussed. In summary, this is why a little due diligence goes a long way and why one size does not fit all. So how does Aviva help business advisors, and this includes payroll professionals such as accountants and bookkeepers, to set up a scheme for a client? In short, what does the end-to-end -end process look like? Well, step one is to log on to aviva.co.uk and click the business tab in the top corner. This brings up the section headed workplace pensions and takes you through to either the business advisor journey, which applies to any business advisor. They do not have to be a financial advisor. Or alternatively, there's a direct journey for employers who wish to do this on their own. For the moment, we will focus on the business advisor journey. As a business advisor, you can easily obtain a quote on behalf of a client by completing a few simple questions on one page, such as number of employees, total payroll, and the amount of contributions being paid. Note every sort of step of the journey can be supported by a team of experts in, in Norwich. You then are immediately presented with a quote. This covers three things. Firstly, the monthly employer pension charge. This is the monthly cost that the employer pays for all the services provided for the workplace pension scheme. Secondly, the annual fund charge. This is the annual investment charge that is applied to the scheme members pensions pot. And finally, note on the left of the screenshot, there is no initial setup fee, which is a common question we get asked from employers and business advisors. If you wish, you can continue to apply immediately or alternatively, a quote confirming all this is emailed to you with a link to continue the journey later and submit an application on behalf of your client if you wish to do so. The quote is valid for 90 days and this is just an example here. Every quote is client specific, so it may differ to what you see here. Assuming your client is happy with the terms on offer and wants to go ahead, then you can complete a short application on their behalf. This will ask for some basic details about the employer and who will administer the scheme. This, of course, may be yourself. 
Once submitted, the employer will receive an email saying this application has been submitted on their behalf. And once approved by the employer, they will have access to a scheme reference number. Once the scheme is live, My Aviva for Business enables the employer and the scheme administrator to access the scheme details, member lists and process and manage opt-outs. A key point to highlight is that the third party administrator working on behalf of their clients will be able to view all their Aviva schemes they deal with in one list under one simple login. They simply select the scheme they wish to work on. Bright, Bright, Bright Pay's payroll processes are integrated with Aviva's system, saving considerable time and cost in performing those manually through the upload of CSV files. In short, it will be a single process straight from the BrightPay payroll software. However, we will still provide access to this site for other tasks such as checking an opt-out, accessing the scheme member list, and adding and removing scheme administrators. A common question we often get asked in the team is how Aviva handles opt-outs. So we have made this um, as simple as possible and disconnected the employer from the opt-out decision. So they do not risk being seen to encourage opt-outs themselves as per safeguarding regulations. When an employee is enrolled, they will receive a joiner pack from Aviva, which details how they can opt-out online, or they can give the opt-out team a call um, on the telephone number provided. If they do so, we send a notification so the payroll can be updated accordingly. If a payment has already been paid for that employee, then we will immediately refund the money to the source bank account. So forgive me for this part of the impression presentation where we fly the flag and answer the question, why Aviva? I promise not to make it too salesy and to keep it relevant to why you attended. So why did they choose us? Initially, they are surprised we accept businesses of any size, even those with one employee. They assumed that Aviva would not be interested in small businesses. Many people recognize the Aviva brand and feel secure with a very financially strong provider. Those close to or past their staging date have found our quote and apply website simple to get themselves back on track together with the telephone support. Many who choose Aviva say they were seeking value for money for them and their employees, not necessarily the cheapest option. Some have come to us after a bad experience, often with a low cost option, often citing poor after sales service, costing them more in the long run. Our pension schemes meet and exceed the government requirements and we're one of the UK's leading pension providers. And then there are the added extras for employees. To answer the question why Aviva, I'd invite people to take a look at my Aviva because my Aviva is much more than just a pension scheme. It's a single dashboard where customers can view all their Aviva policies online in one place. They can access documents, make changes and get immediate discounts to other products. You can access My Aviva via a laptop, tablet, mobile phone or computer. So in summary, we've covered what's next for payroll and auto enrollment, what clients should consider when selecting a workplace pension provider, how to support a client in making that decision, why those staging late need to act now and what they should do, and how Aviva's end-to-end -end processes works and integrate with BrightPay. We've also covered the typical reasons why clients have chosen Aviva. So before taking any final questions and providing some useful um, contacts, just to sort of clarify really, there's some of the sort of reasons why um, clients might contact, uh, might want to take out an Aviva pension scheme. And that's it for me, basically. And it's so it's now time to open up to any sort of final questions. Okay, um, thanks, Adam. That was very interesting there. 
Uh, while we're getting up for the questions and answers, um, I just want to say that um, because of GDPR, um, it's changing how we communicate with you. So after the 25th of May, uh, we will not be able to email you about webinars and events, special offers, legislation changes, hero related news and other group products without you subscribing to our newsletter. So there are a number of ways you can subscribe to our newsletter um, in the survey after today's webinar, in the follow up email that will be sent out tomorrow or on our website. And just so you know, you will be able to unsubscribe at any time. Uh, we're now going to take questions and answers. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible. So if we don't get to your particular question, we will get back to you separately. Okay, so now Vicky and Paul and Adam. Thank you. Um, okay, so a few questions have come in there. Um, Adam, if it's okay, there's just a couple of questions that have come in because it's quite fresh. You've just finished your part. I'll start with those first of all. Um, so the first question is, I work for an accountancy firm. We currently use Nest and we have all our clients on there. If we take on a new client who are already registered with Aviva, how do I go about setting things up? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, so we've got a dedicated team in Norwich who can support um, with the setup of group pension scheme. The great thing with Aviva, these, the quote process takes um, a minute or so, and the application process takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So it's very quick, it's very um, digital. Um, but uh, on the final slide, if you did want to contact um, the team, we can you know talk you through and give you a demo and help you with that. But it's very quick and very easy. Okay, thank you. Um, and you mentioned a monthly fee for employers to run Aviva. Um, how is this then taken? Are you there, Adam? Can you hear me? Yeah, apologies. Yes, yes. I, no, yes you're fine. You're fine. Yes. Yeah. So, um, um, yes, for the monthly fee, how would that be taken? Yeah, so that would be taken um, via direct debit. Um, just to clarify, well, there's not always a monthly fee, so we do price each scheme individually. Um, so it's always worth having a, a little look at the quotation system and, and you know trying different quotations. Um, but if there is a monthly fee, it would be taken by a direct debit um, from the employer's bank account, and that would be separate to the uh, the pension contributions. Okay, um, just a bright pay question in then. Um, how do I migrate to the Aviva API um, from producing the CSV files um, where you've, they've been logging into the portal and uploading them and, and, and sending them manually? Okay, I'll just show that there. I'll just pop back into the software here. So within the pensions utility, I have Aviva set up here. So on the drop down now, if you you just need to make sure you're on the latest version of BrightPay. Um, and then you'll have this submission method option here. So all along for the past couple of years, obviously we've supported Aviva, but using CSV file upload. So the drop down menu now will give you the option to choose to choose CSV file or Aviva API. So you're simply choosing API going forward. Um, when you click on the send now button, um, at step three and step four um, of the two different submission types, um, a, a window will open up and it'll be an Aviva window and you just pop in your Aviva login details, so your login credentials and literally click on send and that will then fire those off into the Aviva portal for you. So lovely and straightforward there. Okay. Um, this one. Um, I know there is a, oh, I suppose, a, a pensions regulators template for the increase um, that's coming in for the phasing, um, but it would be really helpful to have a template in BrightPay that we can send directly to employees, which self populates the name and also the contributions that will be relevant to them. Are we planning on doing this? One for Paul. Thanks, Vicky. Yes. The answer to that is yes. In the 1819 software, which we hope to release next week, um, that will have the facility within it to actually send out uh, those letters informing employees about the increase in phasing. It'll be very much modelled on the, uh, the pensions regulator uh, recommend, recommended format. Um, so, but it is in that. So hopefully, you'll have it in time to send to your employees before yeah. they. And anybody familiar with BrightPay 
at the moment. Um, those, that letter template is going to be available in the pensions utility, which is where I am now on the screen. And there's going to be a letter option here, just here at the top. And that's where you'll find that template letter to send there. Okay. Um, one for either Paul or Adam there. Are there any plans to increase the threshold amount of £10,000 per year? I think that's one for the government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's the DWP that set that each year and there hasn't been a change for a while. So it's it's in their hands. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, just another bright pay question. Um, are you able to complete the declaration of compliance directly through the software? Okay. Okay. Um, the pensions regulator had uh, been looking at and providing an API facility for completing declaration of compliance. Um, but as far as I know, they have now abandoned that. Uh, so unfortunately, that is something that still has to be done through the pensions regulator website. Uh, we won't have API integration with that because it won't be available for us. OK. okay. Um, just another general auto enrollment question about pensions and um, can employers move from a previously self-certified um, DC scheme one which is using one of the three sets um, to a scheme that operates deductions based on the qualifying earnings basis as this would substantially save employers pension costs I don't actually see any reason why not but I'm not a pension expert so I would have to maybe ask Adam would you have any comment on that one Yes, yeah, so uh, I agree with yourself. Um, I can't see any reason why they can't um, change as long as the payroll software allows them. Um, but yes, I am aware of employers who have done that. Okay. Okay. Just another one for you there, Adam. It was just a follow up, really. Um, how is your monthly fee determined? Um, that's an excellent question. So our monthly fee are on our quotation system, we ask around six questions. So we will ask for the number of employees in the scheme, um, the contribution basis that they're using, and the, um, the minimum amounts that they're starting on. And then that gives us um, a, a way that we can sort of price the scheme. Okay, thank you. Um, do you know when they are planning on reducing the qualifying age from 22 to 18 years of age? I don't know, Adam, have you heard anything on that? Can you hear us okay there, Adam? Yeah, apologies, I lost you just for a second. So no, okay. can I just... Yeah, the question again. So have you heard um, any about the plans on reducing the qualifying age from age 22 to 18? No, I haven't heard of it. I've heard it, you know, in discussions, but I haven't seen any sort of set plans for any dates for when that's going to be going to happen. Um, but yeah, I certainly yeah, I have I have a word that, you know, that has been spoken about, but nothing sort of concrete as yet. Exactly. OK. Um... Um, okay, so most of our staff are part-time employees, um, i.e. they have second jobs. Um, how do you deal with this? I'm not sure if this is one for you, Adam, or ourselves. Well, it's no different uh, to a normal employee. I mean, it, it, it's based on an employment-by-employment employment basis that you assess them for autumn enrollment and whether they need to be enrolled or not. Um, so if it's a second job, but they only have very low earnings in that second job, it's more than likely they won't have to be enrolled. Mm -hmm, they won't meet they won't, the criteria. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's the question that was being asked, but okay, that's yeah, my, but, my interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just a nice comment for you there, Adam. Um, just a comment come in to say that um, the support provided by Aviva is excellent. Your staff are very knowledgeable and helpful. So a nice comment there for you. Excellent. Thank you ever so much for that comment. That's uh, appreciated. Um, and just a final question in, dare I close your, uh, your ears here, Adam, <laughs> but is Nest free to employers? Well, our understanding is it is free, yes, but I mean, I suppose there are probably a hidden cost maybe in terms of the percentage of the pot that, I don't know, Adam, do you want to make any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, they, they, it is a different product and they do um, charge the employees differently to how Aviva does. Um, and like like you said, that there's a, a, a different cost, um, a free service um, compared with a chargeable one you can normally um, 
um, you know, see the in the long run, the savings um, are often there uh, as well. But certainly they do charge diff the employee pots slightly differently um, between Nesta and a, 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 a provider like Aviva. Okay, okay, great. So that's all the questions um, finished there. Um, so yeah, I suppose it's just for us to thank you for attending us um, this afternoon. And thank you to Adam over um, in the UK there for joining us as well. Um, just a reminder, just to fill in the survey that will pop up on your screen in a minute, um, if you wish to subscribe to our newsletter, or to book a demo, or if you wish to receive your CPD certificate as well for today's webinar. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nam.